last week we finished up the tools of um, the last, I think, six tools, five or six tools for uh, discipline. So what did you think? What did you try? What was new? What were, did anybody try the one I like best, the, uh, the saying how you're, saying you're sorry with the four steps? Did you, you did you try it? No, but oh. I did print it all off. Uh-huh. Put it on my wall in my bedroom. Oh, so your bedroom? Can, okay. So what did I you think about it. that as a tool? What did you think about that uh, process? Um, it's a good thing. Um, I, I don't know, you know, until, until the time comes and I use it. But it's, yeah, I think it's more something I would use in marriage than in... Well, your and, yours are really pretty little, yeah. yeah so, yeah. yeah, and it is a good one for Mary, but it teaches accountability, and not just the kind of casual. I'm sorry. Yeah, good. Okay, who else would like to share which tool they tried or used or thought about? Well, we didn't end up trying it, but um, role playing actually there was something that um, my husband really wanted to talk to our kids about, our teenagers about, mm -hmm. and part of the concern was um, with them like knowing how to react with their friends about what he was going to talk to them about, and so we talked about having them role play, well, what if your friend says this to you? How oh, you yes, do? yes, and, and yes. And using, but we did, we did talk about the ideas, so. Yeah, and, and did, were they... Usually, if you are first introducing role playing and they're really not used to it, they're a little intimidated to do it at the very beginning. So, how did they? Well, we didn't end up using it with them. We just talked about it with each other. Oh, okay. To use for. To them. use for. And then okay. their reaction was such that it was okay. But good. Awesome. Yeah. It just gives them a different perspective of putting them a little bit in the situation where they're feeling how another person might feel. So it's a good one. the words to say. Like, and, that's always yep, the problem. And learning words. You bet. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, yes? It's been Julia. hard for us as, as I watch other young mothers and our family members, you know, knowing these skills. And as they do it wrong, they're just dying inside, you know, and praying, what do you do? How can you? Because you really can't interfere. No. As far as that no. goes. And I just, oh, I weep for what children are going through and what it's doing to them. So, yeah. If they if they ask for your opinion, you're free to yeah. to tell. It's sad what's to happening in the world as far as how discipline's done and, and what it's doing to their poor self-esteem. And that's that's the key is when we punish, there are consequences that are hard. That so are it's hard. breaking my heart. I just oh. yeah. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Yes. So. Along those lines, it's hard when you see your husband doing something that you've learned is not the best way, and you don't want to nag, and you don't want to say, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> so it's, you know, kind of hard to bite your tongue and word things nicely so that maybe, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. Maybe you can say there's a better way without. How would you say it? Him feel terrible. How about how would you doing. how would you share information without being oh, critical? Oh. Well, it seems like something. I use your name. Oh, <laughs> later too. <laughs> you know, not in the time when you see it, but later on when you have some quiet time together. You know, something I learned in my class yes. that I really liked was. This word, word, you know, doesn't make him feel defensive about what he did, but opens the idea of, oh, there are other There's ways. another option, right, right. And I think that's about the safest you can do, but it can't be in the moment because then it's an attack and, it, and they feel it is critical. Really good. It's been really good. My husband and I have studied your lessons all along together for discussion and understanding, and he's actually taking your other manual and studies it alone. So, wow. Position. So, this stuff is really great when two of you study together. Yeah. You know, you know where you're not even doing it. But, you know, so, thank you. Well, 
tell your husband, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with him that he would want to do that. That's great. Yes. I think they see you change too, though. Like without having to tell them, I think they see the change in you and kind of um, grasp onto that a little bit, I guess. I think that's true. So I sometimes don't have to point it out because I think they just kind of follow suit with what the mom does. Yeah. So. Yeah, especially, especially if you can change without criticizing them then they will notice it and feel safe that they're not being criticized and it, it's a it's a it's a great it's a great thing uh, i think it's first peter chapter 2 or 3 the first few verses in it i can see it in my scriptures don't you hate that when you see it you know which column it's on you know what color you colored it yeah Ugh. chapter and verse yeah, I, I know it's first peter but i can't remember if it's chapter 2 or 3 and Right in the very first part, it says that a husband without the word, I mean, one who doesn't have a testimony, what you have, can be influenced by the conduct of a righteous woman. So it's when you have that righteous example, without criticizing them, that they can be influenced for good. It's a, it's a great scripture. It's a great scripture. Anyone else want to share their any of their disciplining, any of the 14 tools, or if you've changed, or if you just noticed you haven't changed. You noticed anything? Yeah. Um, I, I, just, I don't know if it's my personality or what, but I just feel like I'm so oblivious all the time. Um, and maybe that's why I'm always so impressed with my husband's intentional parenting, because unless it's like a big thing in my face, I don't even, I don't know, maybe it's just doesn't bug me a lot. I, I don't know. It's like it's, it's Everything like doesn't blessing. have to be corrected. Yeah. No, I don't think, well, I don't know how you parent, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't have to be corrected that is just healthy children growing up. Did, oh, I was going to say, I, I try to be a kinder. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did they just kind of go, what are you talking about, well, they Mom? Want to interrupt each other. Yes, yes, yes. They really can't bad. do that. That's yeah. the rule. And so, but honestly, like, once we went back and forth and back and forth, it kind of just settled, like, it solved itself. Like, they kind of were like, okay, I don't have anything else to say, so let's just move on. <laughs> so, I don't know. It was kind of, I don't, it was really, like, cool to watch them. I think it's good not only to solve the conflict, but to teach them to, like, listen so did they actually repeat what the other one said for understanding? They did, but I, they did, yeah, more towards the end, because at the beginning I didn't. They're really, just learning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it worked pretty well. How old are they? Four and seven. Four and seven? Mm -hmm. Oh, I am so impressed. <laughs> I am so impressed. That's a little bit harder one to, for you to apply. You have yeah. to be at zero, and you have to be able to pull them together, and it takes time. Yeah, and that's the thing, is that consciously taking the it takes time. It, that's, I think, the big key. Yeah. Part of it, but. Yeah. But I was definitely one I was keep using. I think it was really If, good. after they get really used to that one, if then you want to plug in the I'm sorry for steps, mm -hmm. then they don't just leave it as, okay, we've talked to the point that we've vented all of our frustrations mm -hmm. and we're not angry anymore. Yeah. But it actually takes them to the point of what will we do about it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So, after they get a little bit more used to doing that, then you plug in that one on the end, and then there is action that is connected with uh, what they'll do differently. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed that you tried that one. That's good, that's really good. Anyone else like to share? Yes, please. So I did the timeout, my daughter was just screaming, and so I just said she had to leave the room until she could come back without screaming and be happy, and. She turned happy, but never came back. 
because she found something else to play with and because um, she was doing a chore and not wanting to do it. So uh -huh. To time out nets have been uh, been the best method because she didn't want to be there in the first place and so she got to get away with <laughs> being there. Uh, but she got calm and that was the purpose, right? Well, the purpose is to get them calm so that you can teach. Okay. So if she's calm, which is essential, you can't do anything with them if they're screaming, but then to go back and get her, bring her back to that task that she should have been doing, you know, talk with her and then have her complete the task. So there's always, with time out, to make it uh, used properly, you have to go back and teach. You have to go back and do the training and teach them whatever it is that you want them to learn that they were unhappy about. That, but that has to be connected. Anything else that we want to discuss before we go on? I can share it. Oh, yes, yeah, please. Um, so this, is, this didn't happen recently. This was probably about a year ago. We did the four steps. Only I did it in my extended family, and um, our extended family is... And they accepted doing it? Trying it? It was our family home evening. So they put me in charge of the family home evening. So that's what I chose to do because we, our family struggles with that, with accepting responsibility. And so, um, and it's all of our family struggles with accepting responsibility. And so we included everybody. And I printed up the little four steps for everybody. And I'd already decided ahead of time. So I went through each step. I gave them some examples. And I said, great, now this is what we're going to do. I said, everybody find a partner right now. And it cannot be somebody from your own family. And so they had to like all intermix. And I said, get grandma and grandpa in there too. And so they, anyway, everybody got in there. So they had to all pick somebody different. I handed in their paper and I said, now you two find something like somebody does something to you whatever you guys find something that you need to apologize about you create your own scenario and so i did that with each of them i said it can be something that's real something you've dealt with i don't care and i said you have a couple of minutes to work it out and then you're going to show us all what it is because you're going to go through all four steps and we had enough of this that there was probably there was probably at least 10 sets wow and we had we had older kids like 18, 19 year olds down to four year olds. And so they kind of all intermixed in all different ages. And so we had some that had like a four year old sibling with, with a grandpa. So we had like a four year old and grandpa and they had to come up with something that they both had to apologize to each other. They both had to do both sides of it. Mm -hmm. And so we went through and we did several different ones. And it was really interesting to watch because at first they were really, really hesitant. And I would say the first four words, I am sorry for, and make them fill it in. And, and then we did, you know, this is wrong because, you know, we'd, we'd fill in each of the individual ones. And so I would say the words so that all they had to do was fill in the blanks. And they had to tell us their scenario first. And then um, we filled in the blanks. And so, and so some of them were really, really silly. And some of them were just like, like they came up with some really <laughs> bad examples. But, um, but as we kept going on, it was interesting because to begin with, it was like dragging it out of them. Like you could not hardly get them to talk. And I did, went to the most talkative ones first to try and get them going. And it still was all you could do to drag it out of them. And then as we went further and further, I started getting to the ones who don't talk and don't accept responsibility and some of those kinds of things. Well, one of the situations was my very red son and um, his cousin who is six years younger than he is and also very 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 red and the only boy in the family and never has any responsibility for anything so we had these two, these two boys and um and they both they both did it and they both used very real examples because i had known about both examples and they both apologized for them to each other even though they weren't to each other. Um, so they both went through it and it was interesting to watch because you could just feel like the tension in the room because everybody knew that both of those were very real experiences because they both knew them. And, um, and you could just watch as, the, as they apologized that like it just calmed, like everything just kind of settled down and everybody just kind of looked at them like, oh my gosh, that actually worked. And then, and even when we got to grandma and grandpa, we made grandma and grandpa do it too. And so they had to apologize for something to somebody else or whatever. And, um, and they did it. They were very, very good. And, you know, and if they weren't doing it, I would fill in the words for them and here, try and say this one. And, you know, so we did things like that with all of them. And then at the end, it was trying to wrap everybody up and try and pull them all back together. And I did a, I did a sheet for each of the families to put on their walls at home. And I'm, so I encouraged them to try it at home that all of them had tried it, all of them have used the words, they had all had that experience. And so now they could take it home and try it. 
And so tr then trying to pull all those people back together is a little chaotic. And so um, as I was pulling them all back together, my brother is a huge, huge jokester, likes to, and, and he's fun. He's a yellow and he's fun and he's great to be around, but he causes a lot of the problems and always has. And so he was, he was really just egging everything on. And, um, and I was getting, uh, at that point, I was getting really frustrated with it because I'm kind of like, okay, let's wrap this up so I can testify and we can be done and we can go play and do whatever. And, um, and he, he must have been able to tell that I was getting really frustrated. He goes, whoa, 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 wait just a minute. And so everybody's like instantly quiet trying to figure out what he's going to say. And he like, here, give me that paper. And so he grabs the paper and goes, Andrea, I am sorry for, and he walks through the whole steps about, I'm sorry for distracting everybody. I, you know, that must make you feel like we don't really care and we're not paying it. Like he went through all four steps and then he apologized and he, and I was like, yes, you did it. You know, so we did the whole thing and everybody's cheering for him. And, and so then we wrapped it up and I said, do you, do you see what just happened? You guys could see how frustrated I was getting. And even though he was totally joking around about the words, in some ways he was serious about what he was doing and you saw what happened. And things are fine and everything's good. So I want you guys to know that you guys can all do this at home. So they took him home and my brother called me a week later and said, guess what? That totally works. He'd been using it in his family. So I don't know if they're still using it or not, but it does work. It helps so much to go through and kind of role play that whole thing out. But it was just funny to see him actually stop and realize, oh, I need to apologize about this. And, you know, even though he was not being serious, he was being serious. And so it was just funny to watch the example of what had happened with it. And I think that's really a good way to present it, to role play it in a family home meeting so that they uh, are non, they don't feel pressure because they've done something wrong, just creating false scenarios and uh, letting them walk through it where they don't feel that pressure of feeling guilt that they've been caught in doing something wrong and they learn that and they learn that it's safe to do it, then um, that, that's a great way to present it, a real good way to present it. Okay, yes? What lesson was that? Oh, uh, that was last week. So which that was one last week. Was well, it was actually the 14th tool <laughs> and well, discipline that's cool. not in the <laughs> syllabus. It's awesome. But it's a really good <laughs> one. <laughs> but it's on the video. It is on the video. It's saying you're sorry, and there's four steps okay. in it. And... Um, it's a very powerful tool to use. It, it's one that is life-changing, could be, could be life-changing if they'll really do it. And if you can help them learn how to do it as a tool for life, it, it's, a, it's good. Okay, so today we're gonna do morality. What is morality? What is it? When we talk about morality, the, and the reason that I say that is because as our youth go in and have interviews with bishops, and the bishop says, are you morally clean? They have no clue what the bishop is really asking. And that goes back to parenting. Parenting should teach them what moral cleanliness is. So if the bishop asks that question, they should automatically know all of the elements that he's talking about and then can can say yes I am so or I kind of am struggling in this area because moral cleanliness has lots of areas and they need to know that so if you had to give a definition to your kids about what does it mean to be morally clean or what is it? What is morality? What would that include in your mind as a parent? What are, what are you looking at teaching your children? When you think about teaching them about morality, what are you gonna, what is it that you're, what is it? Yes? James Gordy says that being moral is helping someone and being immoral is hurting someone. Very good, very concise, very good. Even if that someone is yourself. Very good. Yes? Well, it has to do with what you're taking in to, with your like immediate consumption, with your thoughts and your entertainment that you're choosing. It has to do with your behavior with other people. Because 
your walk, your words, your thoughts, your deeds. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anyone else? That's very good. Words, thoughts, deeds, hurting yourself or someone else. Any other aspects? You, it's harder to make a definition because it has to be so all-inclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of tough. So anything else that you can think of comes to mind about what is morality? Yeah, yeah. I was talking to my cousin. We were talking about politics, and I'm not. I was like, I never thought I'd be a political person. And she's like, you're not. We're just moral. And we were talking about all the, um, just the abortions going on, I guess. So that was something huge for me. So I guess just, and I'm blue in the color code, so that made a lot of sense when she said it. So I guess just. And I guess that comes into hurting someone else. So. Yeah, I mean, it's good. All of these are right, you, and they're just said in a little bit different way, but they're saying it. Uh, the problem in teaching morality in this day and age is because you you said that she says, "Oh no, you're just moral," mm -hmm. because we live in a a moral society. And our kids think that that is acceptable. Then you say, "Are you moral?" They're not exactly sure what that means, because in a lot of their minds, now I'm not talking about your children, society's minds, the minds of society. If you take a stand on um, homosexuality, or abstinence, or not drinking. It's not that you're moral, it's that you are uh, racist or you're, uh, you know, you have bigotry or there's, you know, you're just too, 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 you know, conservative. And so all of the words to describe society would use to describe morality are offensive. So then that means our children don't really want to identify with that. So it becomes our responsibility to teach them what morality is and teach them why it's good and that it's not that you're uh, against other people or condemning other people. It's that you are making a choice to follow Heavenly Father's path. And that doesn't mean you're demeaning anyone else. It means that you are making a conscious choice. So when I think of morality, I think of, and this would be that you have, as well as help your children to develop, a feeling of reverence and respect for sacred things. And when you talk about sacred things, we're talking about the definition the Lord would have for sacred things. So that would be uh, our families, our physical bodies, uh, our country, our, the buildings, the temple, those things that happen in the temple, the plan of salvation, these are the sacred things and that you would develop a true sense of reverence and respect for these things. Now we are living in a society that the feelings of reverence in our society are for sacred things non-existent, pretty much non-existent. We have taken that which is sacred and holy and demeaned it. And if, if any of those feelings uh, were maybe to be identified, it would be for a, you know, a, 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 a youth having those feelings for a, an athletic hero or a movie star. Or, and it's not, it's not reverence, it's maybe awe or idol worshiping, uh, false idol worshiping, but it's not reverence. 
And so that very feeling of reverence and respect is almost a feeling that's devoid in our society. And so it becomes imperative that in the home, it's like learning how to live by the Holy Ghost. We teach it, we create it, and then we identify it. So that our, our children can know what it is when we're talking about being morally clean. What does that mean? Um, I have a brother who was a, a bishop for a long time, and I have a, a son-in-law right now who's a bishop, and they will tell you that our youth don't understand what that means. And short of actually having intercourse, Anything else is morally clean. And that's not true. Being clean, being morally clean is not an event. It's a process of becoming. A uh, whole bunch happens before that problem occurs. So it starts long before that. And all of those uh, preconditions, those things that we do, in advance of that are considered not being morally clean. But our kids don't understand that. So did you read your homework for last week? Was this article on the three things that teens want parents to know? And it was in the Enzyme, uh, February's Enzyme, an article in February's Enzyme. Did any of you read it? Because it is absolutely uh, connected to what we are talking about today. And what's really interesting is this last week, my daughter, who's living with me, had gone back down to San Diego to work on closing the house that she had sold down there, and her two teenagers, one's 13 and one's 15, were staying with me, and I was taking them to school and taking care of them while she was gone. And one day, I had a, on the way home from school, I had a very interesting talk with her 15-year-old and ask her this very question. I said, you know, if you could just say maybe three things you wish parents knew about teens that you don't think that they understand very well, what, what would you say? And it was just fascinating how close her answer came right to these three things. Different, a little bit different reasons, a little bit different take on them, but how close they were. Now, what I want you to connect, I want you to connect dots here today. So I want you to connect the dots of the lessons that we have had leading up to this, with the first one being attachment, and how critical attachment is to start forming that when they're little and creating that attachment so that they if the attachment's not there, they don't respect your teachings on morality. If the attachment's there, then they want to learn from you. They're willing to learn from you. If they're attached to peers, then the peers are the ones they're going to learn from, or they're going to believe and accept that teaching, example, as what truth is. So attachment's critical. And then on top of that, we're going to do intentional parenting, where the teachings that we have now are intentionally to teach them those things that will lead them to a destination, and that destination being the celestial kingdom. So we want to do, teach them those things. But then the levels of teaching, we have to teach the things to the point that they're not just understand them, but they'll internalize them and do them for themselves. Now, just take that part right there. When we teach without attachment and without teaching to internalization, we are simply laying out a whole list of, ground, of rules. And we can lay out all the rules we want, and we're going to talk about good rules today, but if those two things aren't there, then it's just a list of rules that they'll rebel against. Because it's just you being so strict and unreasonable and you don't understand 
the teens. And so you can't tie in the feeling of respect and testimony without uh, the attachment and the intentional parenting being there. Then, if those are there, then you can bear testimony, which takes these teachings off just a list of rules to teaching why. And the why is to protect us and to take us home to Heavenly Father. So but then you take those and then you add in the lesson that we had on communication. And that's how we're going to teach these things. So that their hearts can be open and receptive to what we teach. And we are validating them as a person. Now, because I think that this is so critical, I... In preparation to thinking about teaching these principles of morality, which we're going to talk about, I want to talk, we've got to talk about how we're going to teach them. How, no, we have to talk about what we're going to teach. But if we don't talk about how we're going to teach it, then we can talk about the what all day. And if it doesn't get into them because we've taught it in a way that they'll open their heart to it, it doesn't do us much good and it may do the relationship harm. So these three things are really good as you prepare yourself to teach them these, the commandments that are critical to our returning home to our Father in Heaven. So the first one that's on this, in this article is the fear of being misunderstood. Teens do not feel like adults understand them. Now, it was, it was interesting um, if, if you read that little paragraph about why they felt like teen, that you don't understand them. Uh, but in the article it says, regardless of our, our generational changes, and they specifically are talking about technology here, and that the teen world is centered in technology. And I, when I was talking to my granddaughter, she was saying their identity is technology, is their cell phone. And they feel like the adults don't know how to use electronic, the electronic media, and that they do, and they do. I mean, even three-year-olds, four-year-olds know how to punch out the games that they want to play on a cell phone. And so they really do. But they feel like uh, they have a little bit of a superiority feeling that they're smarter than the adults. And, and it, I'm not talking about specifics in your own family. I'm just talking about this kind of universal feeling among teens. And, and this brings it out. This, this brings it out. So but it also talks about the three basic needs that we've talked about before. We've talked about the basic needs of, of just humans. And the parents have this need and the teens have this need. And that's the desire to belong, the desire to be understood, and the desire to have a place. And, and this article says a place in the world, but it's a place in the family, it's a place in school, it's a place they need to feel like their being there or not being there really matters. They have a place to belong. So when you look at that, they feel misunderstood. Now look at parenting. What is it that we're doing that makes your children, could, could make your children feel misunderstood? What have we talked about in, in the lesson on communication and on attachment and on teaching? What is it? There's the right and the wrong way. And one helps them feel understood and one makes them feel like there's barriers. Well, punishment. If you're, if you're not separating the behavior from the, the person, then, and you're just punishing it to get that behavior out of there, then they're never going to feel like, you don't know why I chose to do that. Exactly right. That's one. How we punish? That's huge. It's huge. But a Another part of it is, is we don't listen. We just want to tell them up front. We want to tell them what to do and tell them what's right and correct misbehavior quickly, uh, punishing them. 
rather than listening to them. Listening is critical and asking questions. And if it means that they feel valued and needed when you ask them about technology, then ask them. But help them know as you ask them that you also understand technology. Because as we get into discussing cell phones and media use, they need to know that you are not oblivious to how it works. That you know well how it works. So, but this, um, this is critical that they do not feel like all parents do is tell them what they're doing wrong. That we care about them as a person separated from deeds and we're really proud of their good choices and we want to help them with poor choices but they always 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 are important and we teach that we teach their divinity and, I, and in a minute we'll go and talk about why uh, number two what in this article was they said um, it's confusion about the standards now, in this case, we're talking about the standards of morality. And he said they, they, do, they want to, this is, they wish to do their best to follow the standards they have been taught, but they're confused about different interpretations. Youth really want to know a line. And then they may push up right next to it, but most of them don't want to cross it. So they, they really do want to do what's right, but they're, but they're not, you know, they have young men and women's teaching them, and they have parents teaching them, and they have sacrament meeting talks teaching them, and conference talks teaching them, and seminary teaching them, and, and everybody, it seems like, as we do a lot of this teaching, it's generic. It's, it's, we're just afraid to tell them how it is, and really get down and have serious talks about what this looks like. And that's why as they go into the bishop and have an interview about what's morality, they don't know. They should be knowing that from home, from parents. It is not the young women's leader, the young men's leader, seminary's responsibility to teach them what those standards are. That should come from the home and it should start being taught about the age of two. We should be starting to teach them respect for their body about age two. So that's the beginning of teaching to morality. And it will become, it should be an environment in our home. And so, but it needs to be very specific. Our problem is, I think, as we teach, we don't often connect dots. So, why would we want to keep our body sacred and covered? What's the dot it's connected to that's doctrine? And we need to connect dots to doctrine so that it's not just a set of rules. We're going to talk about how to do that here in a minute. But number three was uh, the weight of high expectations. Uh, we, we, particularly in the church, have very high expectations for our children, and I don't think that that's necessarily wrong, but it's how we uh, express those expectations, whether or not we're their cheerleaders, and we are behind them, and we want them to, to go and do and be. But I thought it was very interesting that this talks... Um, a lot of times they feel, and I can't remember if this was my granddaughter that said it, or, but they feel like our grades, getting good grades, is more important than who they are. And then they feel like if you don't understand what the, the standards are of the church, that's one thing, and then your parents expect you to be straight A, that's another thing, and then you should be doing the best on the football team or the band or the choir or whatever you're doing. And then you ought to be the best Laurel president that ever was. And we're putting all of these expectations on them. They're very frightened and afraid of failure. And this can create anxiety. 
it can create depression, and it also can create rebellion, where they just quit, say, I'm done. I can't do any of this to perfection. Therefore, I quit. Now, if you look at these three fears that they have, they're really all encompassed in how we're approaching them. It's not what we're trying to teach them. It's how we're teaching it. So we've got to find a way to overcome these three things in our approach to teaching them so that they can hear, accept, internalize, and want, know the why, and, and have a desire to follow the counsel of the prophets. So do you see how these are all connected? Now with this being said, what I, what I want to, uh, to start with, I think, is if we will focus and teach, we tend to teach morality out of fear. We're afraid of the stuff that's out there, and rightfully so. Satan is rampant, and he is effective, and he's seductive, and our kids are being bombarded by it every minute, both in your home and out of your home. So it's not wrong to be fearful, but we cannot parent out of fear. We have to teach these values out of faith, which means we're going to teach rules, and we're going to talk about rules, but if we don't connect dots to doctrine, then rules are simply a set of rules that they feel like are unfair, that God's unfair, that you're unfair, and that it's not right, that they, it's too much, that they should be asked to follow. So the doctrine that we look to is, and I like what... Um, Carol Stevens said, and I think this is a good start. Uh, she said, when a person walks out of the waters of baptism, they have made a covenant to walk out of the world into the kingdom of God. Now, now we're talking eight-year-olds. Now think about when we, you know, I've been to and have spoken at numerous of baptisms. So when we go to a baptism, the little talk that they always give on baptism says, now you're going to be a member of the church and you're going to be, you know, you're going to be part of the kingdom. You're going to be the kingdom, in the kingdom. And this is so exciting and you'll be a member of the church. But we don't connect the dot. That's what we say. Now, I'm, I'm not saying at a baptismal, you know, meeting perhaps, but at home definitely in the home meetings that we should have prior to baptism, it's to teach the eight-year-old that by making this covenant with Heavenly Father to keep his commandments, that's what we say, and then we stop there. But we need to go on and say, and that means that there's a whole bunch of things that your friends will do or say or wear that we won't because we are in God's kingdom. And this is a choice that we make. And so you're making that covenant that you will no longer choose to be like the world, but you will choose to follow Heavenly Father and the guidelines that he set. And then you follow up with, with little people who are getting baptized and you say, what are those things? So we're going to walk into the standards of, of the kingdom. We're going to covenant in the kingdom. And we're, not, we're walking out of the world into the kingdom. But what does it look like to be in the kingdom then? Other than coming to church and taking the sacrament, if we're, if we're not going to follow the world, what is it? Did Heavenly Father tell us then what we should be following? And the answer is yes. And see, this is the beginning of getting them to learn to obey. Obey, follow, want, yearn the standards he has set for them. And you will find that in my gospel standards. That's found in primary. 
and you, you teach them these and you post these in their room and you show them what they are. You have family home evening lessons on it that they come to understand it. Because if they're following this at eight, they're morally clean. If they're following this as a youth, they're morally clean. Now this, I don't know if you've really sat down and looked at this. You need to have read this. You need to almost have this memorized because you should refer to this frequently with your youth. And if you have a discussion with them, it's very appropriate for you to say, why don't you go look that up in For the Strength of Youth? But you better know what it says before you say that. So you need to be very as familiar with this as you are with the first page of the Book of Mormon. So if you look at this, for example, uh, I will be honest with Heavenly Father, others, and myself. It, it follows right into, I will be honest in my dealings with my fellow men. These are in the language of an eight-year-old, but these are in the language of a teen. But if you teach them that this is what it means to be in the kingdom of God, and then you graduate to this, and this is what it means to be in the kingdom of God, and that that's part of it, they now are visualizing, what is this? What is this kingdom that I'm coming to? To them, it means I'm still just coming to primary every week and going to sacrament meeting. They have to have a vision that it's more than that. They have made their first covenant. And they need to know what a covenant is. The second thing is, this is the doctrine to be taught for morality. If you want to teach morality, this is the why. This is the doctrine. It is the doctrine of the family, and it's the plan of salvation. This is the key, the doctrinal key, to teaching morality. So, why would I keep myself free from sexual sin? It's so I can get married in the temple and have an eternal family. That's the doctrine. So if we are teaching this doctrine, if this has become a real important part of your family, and even to the point that I know some of you have memorized it, which I think is wonderful, and if not, uh, at least become so, so, so familiar with it. But see, that's what we do. We become, become real familiar with it and, we, and even memorize it. But then when we're teaching our children and our teens about morality, we're not connecting dots. We have got to connect dots. They have to understand that what they do Friday night can affect the next 10 years. So that they connect dots and understand that choices and decisions that they are making now are not just rules, but they are for the purpose. The why is the doctrine. And the doctrine is eternal families. So we are going to talk about uh, various aspects of this teaching morality. We, we are living in an amoral world. And because we are, um, we have become, as a people, I think, desensitized to even what's out there. And it has become so um, normal with us, if you would. What used to be never, ever, ever shown on TV is now shown on prime time. Um, there's a wonderful story that was told by Elder David B. Haight. Uh, this was in conference of 1992, but it still applies. He was talking about a couple of men, and they were walking across a university cam campus, and they were attracted to a crowd of people surrounding a large maple tree. As they approached, 
They noticed the crowd was being amused by the antics of a foxtail squirrel circling the tree, climbing it, and running back down again. A red Irish setter dog crouched nearby, intently watching the squirrel. Each time the squirrel ran up the tree out of sight, the dog would slowly creep towards the tree. The squirrel paid little attention as the dog crept closer and closer, patiently fighting its time. People watching this entertaining drama unfold knew what would happen, but they did nothing until in a flash, the dog, catching the squirrel unaware, had it in the grip of his sharp teeth. The people then rushed forward in horror, forcing the dog's mouth open to rescue the squirrel, but it was too late, the squirrel was dead. Anyone could have warned the squirrel or held back the dog, but they had been momentarily amused and watched silently while evil slowly crept up on good. And when they rushed to the defense, it was too late. Isn't that a good one? It is 1992. 92. David B. Haight. And I think that that's a, a wonderful story because it's such a visual that you could use in a family home evening lesson if you chose to. But it's so descriptive of what's been happening in our world over the last 15, 20 years. Um, what originally was just not acceptable is now considered prudish. And uh, we have become so desensitized to so many things that we're standing there, there slowly, slowly letting evil infiltrate even our homes and laughing with amusement or thinking it's funny or just becoming so desensitized we don't even see the evil in it. Does that make sense? So if you notice, uh, I would say 10 years ago maybe, uh, 2009, 2010, in those er uh, years, I, I have talks at home and I should have looked at the date on them and I didn't, but it seemed like every conference session, somebody spoke, and usually in the priesthood session, but sometimes in the general conference session, about pornography. And now you notice we're not hearing that directly, specifically, spot on, with sharpness. Uh, it does not mean that that's no longer a problem. It means we've been warned. And we need to be aware of. Now, if you look at what we're talking about now, with keeping the Sabbath day holy, continue to talk about the five legs, family home evening, family scriptures, family prayer, temple attendance. Uh, we, we are building, they're, they're teaching us of the network to keep our families safe. So rather than, we need to be aware, but uh, rather than being driven by fear, we need to be focused with exactness on following the prophet and with testimony, with personal testimony, and helping that testimony be gained in our children. And as we do that, if you go back to when we talked about the small and simple things, if you remember the promises attached to particularly Sabbath day attendance and uh, keeping the Sabbath day holy, you will find that our children will be protected from the fiery darts of the adversary. So as we focus with real intent on building the good, on creating the good, that will help solidify the testimonies, both of ourselves and of our children. But as we focus on building that, we also have to be ever, ever careful, ever aware and watchful of the subtle way Satan creeps in and be mindful to protect our families against those things. So the first thing in teaching your children morality is to focus on those teachings of the prophet that he has 
Uh, if you want to go back to the challenge that President Nelson, have your children go back to the challenge that President Nelson gave about raising a righteous battalion of youth, June 3rd, uh, 2018, uh, Hope of Israel is the talk, and he challenges the youth, and for a moment in time, it was a, a hot button. All the youth were talking about it, all of the adults were talking about it, but do you notice now? It's kind of faded out, and we need to keep that energy flowing if we want to keep receiving the blessing. It is not a, a momentary thing to, to follow and then, and, and then let it go, if you will. So let me um, read you a quote. And this is from Sem Senator Robert D. Byrd, who is no longer a senator. This was uh, in a book, uh, Hollywood versus America, that was written in 1992. So this has been around for a long time. But listen to what he said. And see, now how many years are we later? 92 till now? Some of you are good at math. 27. 27 years. So we're 27 years down the road. See it, what you think about the application of this quote. See if you think he, it was prophecy. He said, If we in this nation continue to sow the images of murder, violence, drug abuse, perversion, pornography, before the eyes of millions of children, year after year, day after day, we should not be surprised if the foundations of our society rot away as if from leprosy. Okay, when he gave that 27 years ago, where were the little people where are they now? We're talking about 25 to 30 to 35, 40 year olds. So, and now look at the problems that we have. You just watch, just watch the news for a week. I mean, it's, it could be scary if you aren't standing in holy places, but this literally is prophecy. It's prophecy. If you just look at, you know, I, I don't watch TV, but if you looked at, because you've got the Netflix and all of this other stuff that competes so with TV, then TV channels have become even more violent, uh, more promiscuous, more in order to try to pull people back to watching them versus going to the Netflix or whatever movies that they can just pull off the internet. So in competing for viewers and making money, they choose to be more and more and more. And with that view before our children, it totally desensitizes them. So let me talk about a few things that I think are um, so important. I'm going to give you some rules, um, but it's more important that you, you teach the testimony. The rules help set boundaries because, like one of the things that their teens are most frustrated about, they want to know the line. They want to know what does this standard look like? What is it? And so you need to talk about it. You need to have open, continuous, not we say, well, I gotta have a talk. Have you had the talk with your kids? Have you had the talk? It cannot be the talk. It has to be open communication for the whole time they're in your home and thereafter. There should be nothing that they should be embarrassed to talk to you about. So the first thing perhaps is, well, I'm just gonna go through a list. Um, body images. Body um, purity, teaching our boys and girls about the image of their bodies. We have a uh, we need to teach them that bodies are holy, that they are sacred, that they are temples of our Father in heaven, and they were given to us for the purpose of creating eternal families. 
And if we keep them sacred, and if we keep them clean, then that's the purpose, is so that we can create families. Now, what happens if you have a family that your children think, I don't really want a family? Do you see why it's so important to have strong families and close families and families that are bonded and we want to be together because now too many of our young women do not want to be mothers. And they do not want to be mothers because we sometimes are portraying this image of, oh, nobody ever cleans up their stuff. Oh, there's all this laundry. Nobody does their dishes. Oh, come. This dog's got hair all over it, isn't it? And they feel like their only value, their purpose, is if they have a career. So we have to teach the sanctity of motherhood, the great privilege, the blessing. There is no greater calling than to be a righteous mother. And we need to teach that both to our sons and our daughters. And then following that, in connection with that, is that we keep this tabernacle clean and pure so that we can have that family. So our, our children, because they are getting their self-esteem, we talked about this when we talked about self-esteem, from Facebook, which are images that are distorted, from Instagram, from the internet, from how many likes they get on a post, from you know how many pictures they get post, because that is a faulty self-image, we have to teach them the true image, which is their divinity. And that's what we do in separating misbehavior, in separating you are a child of God, and that is the principle. And these things are just things you're experiencing in this life, and I'll help you get through them, and I'll help you do them, and we'll celebrate your successes. <coughs> so when they, when they start dressing uh, inappropriately, immodestly, it's usually because it's, it's the trend, it's to please peers, it's to, where's the attachment? I want to be well-liked or looked at well, or you know, I need to have approval of my peers. Or a lot of our young women will be, and, and young men, dress at, for attracting a male, attracting a boy, or a boy wants to attract a girl. And so as we teach them that these emotions are very good, see, we, we teach them in a way that they think they're bad. And so if they have sexual desires, they feel like they're dirty and they're bad and it's awful. And yet it's the greatest thing, it's the greatest gift God gave them. It's wonderful. And we should be teaching them that, that it is a sacred gift that they keep to give to whoever, those emotions, to whoever they're going to marry in the temple. And the arousal and the um, seeking to feel those emotions out of context, which is eternal marriage, is a tool of Satan. So, to, now, for a young man to be just aroused, they just, they can have night dreams and they just are. And they need to know that that's normal. That they're not bad. That they haven't done anything wrong. That it's, that it, that's part of nature. But the schools will teach them in their health classes that masturbation then is an appropriate way to handle those sexual desires as young men as they're growing up. And we need to very openly teach them that that's not right. Now, don't just think that it's the boys that masturbate because the girls do too. And they need to be equally taught that their body is sacred and we don't stimulate or arouse those feelings ourselves, that they are, they are a very sacred, a sacred gift. So that will take you into a conversation about things uh, like kissing. Should we, should we teach our children that they should never kiss? Um, my feeling is no. No. I don't think that we, we should. 
But I do think that we need to teach them that they don't go out and just start kissing on the first date or on any date or on every date as their peers might do. And so they need to learn that a kiss that causes arousal is, they shouldn't be doing that. A kiss of appreciation and thank you for a good date and that was a wonderful evening. That's probably okay. But when we're arousing those feelings and that comes with pornography in what you look at, in physical inappropriate touch, and it also comes, and this is something that I want you to look at. And that is the reading of romance novels. That can be arousing, create emotions in girls that should not be there until after they're married. And then it should be directed to their eternal spouse. Uh, let's, let me just give you a couple of other things. Uh, back rubs. You'll have kids that'll uh, go on a, a youth swimming outing in the summer or boating or something. And afterwards, they're off the lake and they're sitting on the picnic table. And the girl will be sitting on the table and the boy will be sitting on the, the bench and, and, and she'll start giving him a back rub. That's not appropriate. You need to teach your children, both your boys and your girls, that you keep your hands to yourself. And you say, well, what's wrong with that? What is wrong with that? It causes arousal. It causes these emotions to start fluttering around that should not be uh, tempted or tampered with because God will not be mocked. These have been given for sacred purposes. Same thing when they get together and they, they're just hanging out one night and all of the kids are together and they're just watching a video. You know, they're over at somebody's house just watching a movie and they're laying on the floor and you'll have a boy and a girl just lay next to each other and say, we're just watching a movie, Mom. We're just watching a movie. You need to teach them that you don't lay next to an opposite sex. You just don't do it. And one of your kids will say, well, I was there and I was laying and they came and laid down and what am I supposed to do? See, you need to walk through them. Walk through the scenario with them so that they understand. You sit up. That's not hard. You can sit up. You just sit up. You don't even have to move. You can still sit there by them if they're your friend. You don't have to move, but sit up. And it's not, it, it's just the beginning of teaching them how to create a feeling of respecting their bubble, if you will, and so that they don't allow people inappropriately into that, into that space. No full body hugs. I used to pick up my kids at, after school when they were going out and working on the subdivision and I would pick them up and I would meet them at the seminary building and so I would, they would walk across the, from the high school and then you know other kids would come over and my beautiful sons, they would be standing there and these girls would come running up to them and just throw their arms around them and give them these big hugs and you know put one leg around them and I think, not in your life, you know? That's totally inappropriate. And so I would teach my boys that you have a space that is your space to reserve your body in. And they say, well, Mom, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I don't want to be rude. I don't want to be unkind. And I said, it's totally appropriate. As you see them coming, and our girls, we need to teach our girls to be more respectful. They have become very, very, very dominant used to be we were always telling the boys to, you know, it was their response. Our girls, they attack the boys. They, they need to be taught manners. But anyway, I told my sons, I said, there's nothing, I mean, you can turn sideways and give them a one-armed hug. That's okay, but not a full body hug. And so you have to be willing to help them find alternatives that are appropriate so that they feel like they can handle situations. 
and that they feel safe in handling those situations. So you need to give them what they can do. Um, no steady dating, that's President Hinckley. Um, he, he was quoting President um, Kimball. So no steady dating, no steady dating. And, and then he said no steady dating until you're ready to um, find a mate, until you're ready to look for a mate. Now our problem that we have today is that it's not so much of a steady, it is a problem of steady dating because you're either hooked up with somebody or you don't date at all and you just hang out together. You're just hanging out. Now there's problems in both camps. Part of the reason our teenagers don't want to ask somebody out is because if they ask a girl out or a girl goes out, either, you know, they go out on a date, just a casual let's go bowling date. If they have a date, peers hook you up as going together that you're a thing. Dating means you're attached. And so they, in their world, they don't even really want to just date because they don't want that gossip to go around the high school and the school. Well, to me, the only way you can break that is to date lots and to date in groups and so that you have several people. Now, over here, not dating and just hanging out, the problem with that is, even in high school, uh, is that they're not learning how to take care, boys are not learning how to be respectful of girls and take get, care, care of girls, and girls aren't res learning how to be respectful and honor, honor the priesthood. And We need to try out lots of different kinds of personalities, figure out what we like, what we don't like, but still learn how to be respectful to everyone. So there is a need for dating, for us to learn how to be involved with the opposite sex. We need to have friends of the opposite sex. We need to go to parties and be at activities where there's boys and girls. And you've seen kids that are together and they can act so silly. The girls can just act ridiculously silly. And the boys just have to prove that they're so macho. And it's all in this learning curve. It's healthy. It's not bad. They need to go through this so they can learn how to improve on it. So they can learn how to really <laughs> get along. And it's wonderful missionary prep that they can learn how to get along with people. So it, it was my daughter, uh, in the last couple of years when her boys have been home, she would mandate that they had to go on a date. I don't know, once a month or something. They had to officially call a girl, take her out, set up the date, you know, organize it. These are all fabulous learning tools. Whereas if they're just always hanging out, they don't, they don't have them. Now, hanging out. What we have in that camp is our youth will say, well, we're not going steady. We're not going steadily. We know we're not supposed to steady date. That's why they're, under, they're understanding standards. But they'll hang out every Friday and Saturday night and be paired up with the same person. So they go to the hangout party and they're just paired up with the same person. So everybody, including them, kind of know that they're paired up. But they'll say, but we're not steadily dating. So we're not doing anything wrong. So you might change the term from steadily dating to say being paired up. And if you're paired up, you're paired up. You're paired up. So it's one of those things that we just need to be sure that they're understanding, um, they're understanding it. Let's talk for a minute about cell phones. Because I think that cell phones are a hot issue 
that a lot of parents are upset about and they don't um, they don't quite know how to deal with them they're they're very frustrated with them the the thing with a cell phone is you've got to negotiate it up front so you've got to decide how you feel and what you're going to do about cell phones before an emotional moment where a sixth grader is coming to you and feels like they have they have to have a cell phone because everybody else has a cell phone and you just gotta have a cell phone. It's, you know, you're just ostracized at school because everybody's texting everybody and you can't because you don't have a phone. So you have got to decide what you're going to do up front. That's the first thing. The second thing is in making that decision um, I think it's imperative, just like we have talked about intentional parenting, uh, it's important that prior to them having any screen, you have taught them how to use a screen. Now, screens, your children need screens. They need to be taught how to use screens. Screens are how they learn at school. They have to have access to computers, to the internet. They don't have to have their own cell phone right away. But in elementary school, they're going to have homework on computers. And they need to know there is nothing wrong with that. So if you are fearful of a child misusing a screen, then you up front, before they have that privilege, must teach them how to be responsible. And so there needs to be groundwork set. Now, some of you are um, kind of going, yeah, but I'm not sure what to do or how to do it. So I want to give you a couple of ideas our sources and and it really doesn't matter what you use but you need to use something for your training this is one option that um, I personally like because uh, she would be my niece by marriage I guess um, my sister-in-law's kids put together what's it's called a tech university and it's a whole course that you and your family would go through before they would be able to have a device and it teaches them how to find fun things online it teaches them how to post messages from the church online it teaches them how to research fun things online there are wonderful, wonderful reasons why the Lord has allowed technology to be where it is. And it's for the gathering of Israel. But there are so many ways that it can be used for good. And you need to know how to teach it. And this gives them homework assignments they have to do. And they have to pass the course before they are entitled. Just like they have to pass driver's training before you can drive a car. They would have to pass the course before they could have their own screen. So this is a wonderful tool. Uh, Andrea will post the link. Uh, there's another wonderful idea that is in a site called sunshineandhurricanes.com and it is Technology 101 for Parents series. Uh, don't know that she's a member of the church, but I would certainly say she was. Um, by just some of the things that you know people say but on this she has some amazing rules and I'm going to kind of go over those with you really quickly and if you want a copy of this it's a wonderful again it's just an idea it's just a groundwork and it doesn't matter what you use it's imperative that you have this training program before they are entitled to any personal devices. 
Now with this being said, I'm going to give you these rules, but this being said, on the home devices, there has to be rules. And filters is one of them. You need to be sure that your uh, screens have filters. And Andrea will post some really good filter that you can have on your screens. You need to uh, have them, well, I think, let's go through these rules because I think a lot of these cover them. Number one is technology. That's a cell phone, that's an iPad, that's a computer, that's any kind of screen. That's video games, that's any screen. Any technology is a privilege, not a right. So they don't just get it because theirs is the generation of technology. Until they can prove themselves responsible with it, then, then it's just a privilege that they earn. It's not a right that they have. Uh, number two, all technology must be parent approved. So whether they're watching uh, a show on the computer or a Netflix or downloading something, it needs to be approved by you. And when it is not, the upfront agreement is the privilege is lost. It's not, it is not one of those things where I will come back and give you the lecture and then still allow you to do it. Uh, there's a site called Common Sense Media that will give you what is appropriate or inappropriate for children. Number three, in this upfront contract, we value people more than technology, which means you learn to have face-to-face -face conversations with people. And our teens nowadays, according to my granddaughter, would say that, well, that's the way we converse. That's the way we have our social interaction is texting. You know, we text all day. At, I mean, we, we talk to each other at school. You know, we, we really talked at school. And so when we get home, we just need to keep texting to keep that conversation going. And truth is, they don't need to keep that conversation going all night too. People are important, and that means that people in your own family are important. And it's time to also be setting and creating those relationships. So that's one reason why there has to be, um, number four, there has to be limits set on screens and particularly phones, no phones. The dinner table is a zone-free, phone zone-free zone, period. That's it. There's no discussion. Which means you, mom and dad, have to be the example in all of this. If we're telling our children it's no phone time, no texting at home at night, then unless it's part of your job, which it could be if you were an electrician and you were taking jobs, you know, at night and setting up jobs, it may be that you would still need to have screen time. But basically, uh, texting friends all night is not necessary. You will have some of your children that will say, well, I just want to stream my music on my phone. That has to be up to you, but there still needs to be times that are docked, no screen times. And you need to set that up front. And then when those things are broken, consequences that have been set up front need to be applied. Number five is there is no, 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 did I say no? I mean none. Technology behind closed doors. That means in the bathroom. That means in a bedroom. That means in an office with a closed door. So that means as children are working on homework and they're using a laptop computer, that needs to be in a public place. They can be sitting at the kitchen table, they can be sitting at the counter, you can have a special desk that's for schoolwork, but it needs to be out in the public. It needs to be out where people walking past can see what's up, see what's on the screen. 
and you need to know how to check history and know how to log into all of your children's devices. You need to have access to all of the passwords. And then you also need to know that teens are not dumb and they vary. If they want to be sneaky, they can set up a secret account with a different name and a different password that you won't know, but they'll tell all their friends that and that's what they'll communicate with their friends on. So there are some of your children who are so electronically savvy, they are so smart, that you almost can't. Um, but, but if you're to that point, you've already lost the battle. Because this whole thing is based on attachment and respect and they're having gained a testimony that they want to do what's right. But you still need to set these groundwork wor works to help them develop self-discipline uh, because it doesn't come easily and it oftentimes doesn't come naturally. Number six, chores and homework come before TV and video games. And talking about video games, we already talked about it, they must be approved by mom and dad. And violent games, just because they're not blowing up people, are still violent. So you need to be very aware of what games your children, as they get to be teenagers, are desiring to play. And you need to know what they are and think about what they're teaching and discuss those things with your child. It's not just a yes or no. Talk about what makes them appropriate or what makes them inappropriate so that we're training and we're teaching. Number seven, when you tell a child to turn off a device, that is not negotiable. And this is set up front. So if they come back and there's some pushback, it's just an automatic. You take the device for whatever agreed on period of time it is. But every time you tell them to turn it off, it, that's non-negotiable. If you've reached a point where you have to tell them to turn it off, it, that's the way it is. They, um, they can lose that privilege. It's a privilege. So for them to lose that privilege for a season, there's nothing wrong with that. They have the right to gain it back. And you have to help them know what they can do to gain it back. Number eight, if you break it, you get to help pay for it. It's not a handout from mom and dad. And number nine is just what I was saying <coughs> before, is that if you don't use technology appropriately, you use the right to it. This is a really good, uh, a good site, and it is a good printable rules and you can go over this with your children, sit down with them and use this as a, you know, as an option for rules that you negotiate with before uh, giving them a device. There's another a site, There's, this is part of your homework that I would like you to do. I probably should give you your homework. There's a couple of things that I really want you to look into. Um, one of them is, I would like you to go, uh, Andrea will have a couple of these on, on, you know, links if you're interested in them. But your homework is, I want you to read Talking to Youth About Pornography. This is an Enzyme article. And it is from uh, July 2007 by Dan Gray. Dan Gray, he's a licensed psychologist, social worker, I guess. And I want you to read that one, talking to your children about pornography. Is that the end end sign? Yes. Okay. Yes. Those of you who have teenagers or preteens or almost teens, or if you just need it for your file, the link will be there for this one on uh, teaching the, the tech university for any kind of screen, any kind of technology. So you can look at that if you'd like. Uh, but the one I want you to read now or 
print the copy and save it for when you need it if your children are pretty little. And this is similar, but it's called the Dating Academy. And it's teaching the rules and the proper etiquette for dating. And it's done in an extremely positive way. It's uh, written by Matthew O. Richardson, who was the second counselor in the General Sunday School Presidency. And he did this in his home. And it was so, so fun that other youth in the ward ask if they could come and be part of the could we come to the dating academy could we come be part of this could we come do this and so those of you who uh, probably have a little yellow in you and want to make something fun this is an exciting fun thing so this was in the ensign in august of 2014 and it's teaching children about relationships in the dating academy and it is Excellent. And then there's one more that I want you to do. And I want you to go to the uh, church site and go to uh, overcomingpornography.org. It's all lowercase written together, overcomingpornography.org. And on that site, when you get there, you will find... Uh, a series of family home evening lessons. Um, I want you to pick one of them that you think would be fit for your family and do it. Um, you will, it, there, it covers quite a range, but all of it is on teaching morality. And these are excellent family home evenings that are already set up for you. And then the hard one. I always have to have a hard one. These are pretty easy. I want you to accept President Nelson's challenge of a seven-day family media fast. And if you're really courageous, what I would really like you to do is because most of us think we're doing pretty good and we're not addicted and it's okay, uh, what I really would like you to do is perhaps this summer, which would make it even a little bit more challenging, go on a 30-day media fast with no screens, no TV, no internet, cell phones only for use that you know you really need to have, which for kids is not texting their friends. They can call, they can talk. So um, to extend, maybe try two weeks, just to extend it a little bit longer. Many of your children will um, say that that movie's not bad or it's not okay. There's just one little bad scene in it. It's just one little thing. It's just images that children see and that you see will be there forever. They don't get erased. They don't get wiped away. So one little bad scene is bad. It's not, it's um, the test of what is evil, it's not its degree, but its effect. And if there's one scene, there is the effect of it. Let me share with you um, a story that was told in, this was in a conference talk by uh, President Hinckley, and it was given in May of 2007, well, uh, April of 2007, and he was sharing uh, an exam uh, a vision, if you will, that uh, President Joseph F. Smith had when he was young, when he was a missionary. Had a, he was called on his mission, I think, when he was 15, and it was very, very difficult. Anyway, he said, and, and so this is the story of Joseph F. Smith is telling the story. Well, in that condition, I dreamed one night that I was on a journey, and I was impressed 
that I ought to hurry, hurry with all my might, for fear I might be too late. I rushed on my way as fast as I could possibly go, and I was only conscious of having just a little bundle, a handkerchief, with a small bundle wrapped in it. I did not realize what it was when I was hurrying as fast as I could, but finally I came to a wonderful mansion. I thought I knew that it was my destination. As I passed towards it as fast as I could, I saw the notice which read, B-A-T-H, bath. I turned aside quickly and went into the bathhouse and washed myself clean. I opened up this little bundle that I had been carrying and there were some clean white clothing, a thing I had not seen for a long time because the people I was with did not think much about taking th making things exceedingly clean. But my clothing was clean and I put it on. Then I rushed to what appeared to be a great opening or a door. I knocked and the door opened, and the man who stood there was the prophet, Joseph Smith. He looked at me a little reprovingly, and the first words he said, Joseph, you are late. Yet I looked with confidence and replied, yes, but I am clean, I am clean. He clasped my hand and drew me in, then closed the great door. When we go home, Will the Father take us? And can we say, and can our children say, I'm clean. I'm clean. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.